Psalm 119. Amen. I love this chapter. It's about the Word of God. The whole thing's about the Bible. Amen. And uh, Brother Gabbard was here the other day and he preached on awe. Oh, I love awe. Oh. That, was, that was a tremendous message. It was a tremendous sermon. And while he preached, I got me a sermon with about 20 points. And so I'm going to try to give you, <laughs> give you some of that. Amen. Uh, Psalm 119, 161. Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. Father, we love you. Thank you uh, for being so good and kind to us. Thank you for Brother Gabbard preaching and provoking our mind. And uh, thank you for those that showed up to come to Sunday school. May they get something. May they learn something from your Bible. And uh, Lord... We'll give you the praise, honor, and glory now in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I got a sermon that I haven't preached here. I preached in revivals on 126. Psalm 120, or 119, verse 126. It is time for thee, Lord, to work. The psalmist is saying, hey, God, it's time for you to get busy. It's time for you to do something. Why? For they made what? Void thy law. It's like taking a, a check and writing void across the front of it, making it worthless, useless. It's of no value. It's of no power. It's of no effect. Listen, we've gotten to the place where the Word of God means absolutely nothing to the world. It means absolutely nothing to churches. It means absolutely nothing to average Christian. I'm just saying average Christian. I'm not saying all Christians. Uh, you say, how do you know? Because you don't see it relevant in their conversation. You don't hear them talk about the Bible. They talk about everything else but the Bible. Their desire, their hearts not to apply the Bible. They don't want to practice what the Scripture says because the average Christian attempts to hear something from the sermon, to come down and hit the altar and apply something in their life, say, God, this is where I'm lacking it, and this is what I need, and I'm going to take off and use this in my life, and I'm going to set forth my heart to follow these principles, and they go out there. Christians are usually the first ones to sideswipe another Christian for trying to believe that book and accept Christian principles in their life. Then they got to deal with a family. And when they begin to deal with a family, then they have another head-on collision with people. Like, what in the world are you trying to do? I'm trying to live clean. I'm trying to live pure. Oh, so you're saying we're wicked. I didn't say that. You come to that conclusion on your own. I just believe going here is not right. I believe doing this is not right. My family's not going to watch this. We're not going to go there. We're not going to do it. Well, who do you think you are, mister? And all of a sudden, you're in trouble because you want to start applying the Word of God. Right. So the average Christian won't apply the Word of God. They won't even attempt right. to do it. Amen? And uh, they say it's just not worth the headache. It's just not worth the heartache. But I'm telling you, it's worth standing up for righteousness and doing right. Listen, I stand in awe of God's book. Look at 127. Therefore, I love thy commandments, what? Above gold. Man, that's how your heart ought to be set on this book. This world is coveting gold, desiring gold, wanting gold. You can hardly turn on a radio program without them advertising gold. Buy gold now, buy gold now, buy gold now. When the dollar crashes, you better have gold. Yeah, man, you're going to have gold where? No, where, where are you going to have actual gold? They're telling you to buy gold. Where you, you, they're going to send you a cube? They're going to send you 10 ounces, 20 ounces? Oh, they're going to give you a credit, just like the bank does now, and it's going to be an electronic bank account, right? you got electronic gold. I gave $5,000 to buy two ounces of gold. Okay, you know what? Where, you got that two ounces of gold in your possession? You think when the market crashes, you're going to see anything? Oh, the computer crashed. We don't have record of what you purchased. You understand me? It's, when it goes, it's all gone. Amen, amen, amen. Listen, you don't hold gold. Your dollars ain't worth gold. You know what's more precious than gold? The book. Amen. You want something that, that's substantial, that's more important, more greater than any gold? It's this book. The words of this book. Job said, I esteem his words more than my necessary food. 
That's where our heart needs to be on this book. The average person don't esteem the Word of God more than their necessary food. They don't esteem it above gold. Yea, above what? Fine gold. <laughs> Amen. I'm telling you, listen, that your heart needs to be set right on this book. This book is the most important thing we have on the face of the earth. More important our job, more important our car, more important any relationship we got. Your relationship with this book is more important than anything else on the face of the earth. And you know what? The average so-called Christian is not had this is not esteemed. Amen. So how do you know it? How much it's read? How much time is it spent in it? Amen. You understand? Listen, when uh, Mrs. Goforth, she wasn't Goforth yet, but when she seen Jonathan Goforth in a youth meeting, he set his Bible down to go do something. She picked up, she reached over and grabbed his Bible and set it down. She said, I'm going to marry that man. Her judgment upon the man she wanted to marry was upon the things that she's seen written in his Bible. And she said, that's the man I want to marry. See, she has seen, esteemed a relationship with that word being more important than the career that man was living, than houses that he could provide and cars. It was his relationship to that book that she valued, and she said, I want to marry that man because of what I've seen him do inside his book. How many people got that kind of appeal about them that they say, I want to base my life upon that man because that, well, I want to follow that guy because of his relationship to that book. Well, I'll tell you what, that says a lot. Why do you think a lot of people want to follow Dr. Ruckman? Yep. His relationship to that book and what he knows about that book. There's a lot of men that hate him. Why do they hate him? Because they can't deal with him when it comes to that book. Because he'll trip them up and he'll file them up. And so they, they're, in their pride, they want to condemn him for his roughness. And his toughness. But when you're raising soldiers and you're training soldiers, hey man, don't you want a drill sergeant that's a full blooded veteran, a man that's been in a battle and knows how to survive on the battlefield? That's the one I want. The one that's got scars on his face and, and, and uh, been through some battles. Hey man, that's the guy. I want the veteran that can teach me something so I can know how to survive. That, that old veteran down there knows his book. Amen. I, I want somebody who's got a good relationship with this book. Verse 28, Therefore, in view of that, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be what? Right. <laughs> wow, what a confession of faith. You talk about something that's good. I esteem that book to be right on every subject and every topic it deals with. And it's right and I'm wrong. And I must line my life up to this book. Amen. Amen. That's why the world don't want this book. They don't want it in school because they don't want to line up with it. Because they want to live the way they want to live and do what they want to do without an ounce of conviction upon their conscience. They don't want to know that anything's wrong, so whatever they do, it's right. But there's a final authority. And I esteem the precepts of the Word of God to be right concerning every subject. I, this, this is my governor. This is my director. This is my guide. I serve a paper pope. Amen? This book. I make my decisions out of this book. I guide my life and affairs by this book. How I treat and handle people is governed by this book. How I treat my wife and my children. How I lead the church. How I handle sinners. Everything in my life is based and governed upon the mind and the thoughts and the words of this very book. That's foreign today. The world does not want to govern their lives. They want to govern it by, well, I think, well, I feel. It doesn't matter how I feel. It, it does not matter how I feel. See, we're living in a society that you might hurt somebody's feelings. It doesn't matter. People's feelings does not matter when it comes to this book. If anybody's feelings ought to be taken into consideration, is how does he feel about yeah. what I'm about to do? Right. How does he feel about how I speak. Amen. How does he feel about what I'm thinking in my mind? There's a lot of things he writes about knowing the thoughts and intents of my heart. Yeah. Amen. He knows my motives. He knows my imaginations. He knows my secrets and my mind and what I think about every day when nobody can look and see. He is interested in my mind. I better be thinking about something right because I'm going to face him and have to give an account of my thoughts and imaginations of my heart and the intents. Why I do what I do. 
And why I say what I say, listen, it's very important. This man's, this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, his mind is more important because I got to face him. Amen. He can't send me to hell, but boy, he can, he can sure take me to woodshed and put something on me I don't want to get hold of. Now, he don't stand over me and beat me up because I didn't read my Bible today or whatever. But I have to suffer the consequences of the neglect. Right. And you know what? Neglecting the Word of God and neglecting prayer and neglecting the house of God and neglecting preaching and neglecting doing the things that God wants in our life is dangerous. Because the very things that we may need, we may not have the anti-venom, so to speak, in our life to combat the new so-called viruses of sin out there, which may poison and damage a Christian home and a life. And so I come and I get the anti-venom, faith, to defeat anything that the world throws at me. And I get strong spiritually and I build spiritual muscles that I may be able to go out in that world and fight spiritual warfare. You understand? It's what this book says. The only way I can survive and make it in this world is what this book says. And that's why I said I'm unprogrammable. Amen. They want to send me to sensitivity training. And I tell them it's a waste of time. Don't even try it. Amen. So why? Because I'm going to think the way the book thinks. Amen. What's God say about a sodomite? Amen. I don't care what Barack Obama says about him. I don't care what the news media says about him. What's God say about him? What's God say about adultery? I don't care what Hollywood does and portrays it every video, every, every 24 hours a day you're seeing adultery and fornication. I don't care what, adult, uh, what Hollywood and all the media says about it, what our neighbors and what our children and, and what, our, what our relatives are practicing. I'm talking about what's the book say about that? What's the book say about stealing? What's the book say about honesty? What's the book say about lying? See, that's what the matter is. And so how am I going to deal with mankind and how I spend time dealing with people? That's what matters. Get in God's mind. Amen. Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things. Oh, does that cover a little territory? <laughs> that book's covering every subject, every topic that we need to deal with. God's got it. And the problems that Christians have, if we go soul winning today and bring in 30 new families, we're going to bring in 30 million problems. And they're going to have to learn and grow and hear preaching and read Bible and spend time in prayer and take all their problems to God and line it up and follow the instructions because the reason their lives are in a wreck is because they didn't know the instructions or they refused to follow the instructions. And therefore, their lives are out of control. And then they need to develop the character to be here every service, to come to every meeting, to hear all the preaching, to get their lives lined up, that they may be able to get the Word of God worked in and get all that junk flushed out. Amen. They don't want to get it flushed out. They want to sit back and flush this out and get this out of their lives. Let's finish the verse. Therefore, I esteem all things concerning... Uh, or, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every what? False Let me ask you a question. What do you hate? Preacher, you're so mean, you're so hateful. I'm trying to practice the book. Do you hate false ways? There's something wrong with you if you don't hate the wrong ways. Psalm, Psalm 45. I'm telling you, the world's trying to tell you, lay off me. The world's trying to say, don't go there. The world's trying to say, leave me alone, you bad Christians. Don't say nothing against my sin. You leave me alone, leave me alone, leave me alone. And the Christian goes, okay, I'll stay in my little mouse hole and I'll hide. <laughs> What's a Christian supposed to do? He's supposed to roar. Amen. We need some roars. Amen. Not Rory McRoy's. We need, we need roars. Somebody's going to roar. Christians, listen, I ain't been in Africa. I don't plan on going to Africa. Amen. I don't plan on being out there in the Congo in the tall grass and one of them lions want to roar. Oh, my soul. They say they said your heart about stops. Your blood runs cold. Amen. You hear one of them things roar. <laughs> I mean, hello. I mean, I have a bad enough time looking at a pit bull barking or a Rottweiler. Amen. I can't imagine a lion roaring. Right? 
Psalm 45, verse 6. Thy throne, O God, is what? Forever and ever. And the scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and what? Hatest wickedness. Did he move in? Has the new resident that's supposed to be president taken control of the throne of your heart yet? If he has, there ought to be things that now you hate that you used to love. Right. And there ought to be things that you love that you used to hate. He will fill your heart with hatred for the wickedness. How Christians can love it and get close to it and cuddle up next to it and think that's righteous. Oh, sinner. Hello, oh, sin. Oh. And they just let that sin like a puppy break all over them. You better not treat sin like a puppy. You better treat sin like a crocodile. That it wants to sneak up on you. Amen. I've seen, I've seen animals, amen, sitting there sipping water down there and they're trying to look and watch and they got no idea there's a set eyeball sitting right there next to them. And they're down there sipping that water. I mean, that, that antelope is gone. That impala is gone. Amen, that crocodile jumps out of the water, grabs it by the neck, takes it in the water, begins to spin and snaps his neck, and it's over with. And then four or five crocodiles get a hold of that, they just rip it to pieces. I tell you what, that's the way sin is. You just come in and creep in on you. You know, Satan's like a big cat, right? A lion. You know how you ever see a cat hunt? Huh? It sneaks up on you? Right? You know about a cat, don't you? It's down on the ground, hunkers down, right? It hunts. I'm telling you, sin will hunt a sinner. Sin hunts saints. And it sneaks up. And it gets a hold of you when you don't expect it. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to move ourselves far from it. You know, the best thing you can do, and I try to do, is I try to cultivate an attitude towards things that God hates. I want to hate them. And God said, that's a hateful thing. I said, good, I hate it too. God, I hate it just because you hate it. Hey, man, I hate it. And I develop a hatred towards it. But you've got to be careful. You can hate drunkenness, but you better be careful about hating a drunkard. Amen? Listen, I'm all for good standards, but I've got to make sure I keep a right attitude towards those that don't have standards because it can affect my life towards me. Right. Right? But i got to be careful. The Bible says I'm not to have no fellowship. Why does Christians want to go have fellowship with those things? Why do they want to embrace those things? God said there's a danger of fellowshipping. I don't need to go to a bar and shoot pool and have a Coke and fellowship with a bunch of people that want to cuss and swear and live wickedly and sell dope and rock and roll. and do. I don't need to be around all that. That's a bad environment. God says, get out of there. There's nothing wrong with trying to reach those people, but I don't need to go into an environment like that and try to have Christian fun. Right. Well, there's nothing wrong with shooting pool, but where's the pool table? Amen. <laughs> we got to be careful. Yeah. You understand? We need to hate what God hates. Listen, the Word of God. I stand in awe of it. I, I esteem it to be more precious than gold, than fine gold. And I'm to hate every false way. And when He moved in with me, there ought to be some things you start hating as a Christian. Especially something that God deals with you about. You got any sin God ever dealt with you about? And then you decided, I'm just going to go out and sin some more on that a little bit after God dealt with you about it? And then God takes you to the woodshed and so says, I guess you just didn't learn the first time, did you? And he takes you back into that woodshed for round two. You know what? I think you'd come out of that woodshed going, whoo I ain't going that route. We learn the hard way. Yeah. When's the average person quit smoking? Yeah. <laughs> After they've done so much damage to their body, they can barely... Listen, my mom just got news. The doctor told her to quit before you can have any surgery. He said, we can't operate on you. It's been two years this coming weekend. She's quit smoking. And the doctors did a test on her and it says, there's no way we can do surgery for you. You're too far gone to have surgery. She's tore up about it. Basically, prepared to die. You got to live in the condition you're living in? Why? Because almost 60 years of smoking has ruined your life. You understand what I'm saying? 
has gone beyond the past point of no return. Part of it's her age, part of it's her health, part of it could be Medicare saying, we're not going to operate on somebody your, your age. To them, it ain't going to be worth spending $100,000 to fix her hips or do whatever. She's just going to have to live with it. Just give her a happy pill. And one day, somebody will be in a nursing home, walk in, say, I'm tired of giving this woman happy medicine. I'm just going to give her a little extra dose and send her out la la land. That stuff what happens. Listen, people usually don't quit their sin and their lifestyle until it causes pain. And one thing about sin is God attaches problems to sin. Terrell Bear preached one of the greatest messages I ever heard on sin always complicates life. You want to mess your life up? Go ahead and sin. Go against the Word of God. Disobey this book and find out it's got consequences. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter number 3. 1 Samuel chapter number 3. As Brother Gabbard was preaching, my mind began to race about being in awe of his book. Being in awe of the Word of God and standing in awe and just soaking it in and, and enjoying his book. Samuel is an answer to his mama's prayers. Hannah was barren. She prayed. God answered her prayers. Chapter 2 is a prayer about her son. And she fulfilled what she said she would do. She gave her son to God. Amen. Samuel's been given to God. And in 1 Samuel chapter number 3, verse 1, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Amen. Boy, the Jews required a sign. They, they, they had to have men talk to them. Amen. Through the human and through them and, and uh, different methods and ways. They had the law. But the word of God was precious, meaning it was rare. To get a fresh, new, open message from God was rare. You understand what I'm saying? And uh, let's turn to Amos. The rarer something is, is the more precious it is. Water is a precious commodity to us today. We enjoy water, but we'd rather have pop and tea and Kool-Aid and juice and all kinds of other things than just water, right? But turn around and let water get to where you start rationing it like they're doing in California. Uh, be in a desert and have three men and have one canteen and you've got to go through a desert. You tell me how precious that water turns into and how they want to start bartering with each other. And then they start plotting. The, the biggest guys look at the littlest guys and say, well, we can, we can get rid of him. Hello. You ever remember Far Side cartoons? Huh? One of the Far Side cartoons I seen one day, I laugh because it's true. There's a couple fellas on a raft, right? And they had a dog. And they're lost at sea. And somebody finds the raft. And the dog's sitting there wagging his tail, and there's skeletons right there on the raft. Amen. When it comes to survival, the dog ate the men. <laughs> Amen. And the dog's all fat and happy. Amen. He leaned over the raft, drank a little water, and he, he killed his companions. Listen, survival of the fittest. That was evolution in his play. Right? Listen, when it becomes rare, and it becomes hard to find, it becomes precious. And if the stock market crashes tomorrow, amen, it ain't going to matter who put their lips on this if you need a drink. You ain't going to sit there and worry about who is sipping on that. You'll be taking water out of somebody else's mouth. You'll, you'll dip a rotten tin can in something to sip water. You'll be down in a, a mud puddle trying to drink before it gets muddy. Listen, when water gets rare, you'll, you'll, it'll be precious. You'll sell all you got to get water. Well, the Word of God's here in America. It's in abundance. And they, they can have preaching everywhere, but they don't have the Word of God anymore. They've done got rid of it. you got churches on every corner, and Jesus is outside the doors. He's not there. He's not inside. And uh, Amos chapter number 8. you got Joel, Amos. Amen. Let me get there. Amos chapter number 8. Verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that what? Who? I. Who's I? 
the Lord, behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. God sent this famine because man, he's dealing with man's heart. Man doesn't want the truth. So there's a famine out there for people to hear it. Because it's not in the pulpits for the most part. Hello? You don't hear it on the radio for the most part. Amen? All the good preachers, they won't let on there because they're politically incorrect. Nobody's going to get on our radio and hinder our profit margins if they preach on sin because people won't contribute. Do you realize that people are paying big bucks to control the radio waves and the television airline, or airwaves and everything? They're paying big money to control it, to program society. So the independent Bible-believing preacher has got to go outside and let his voice be heard somewhere else. They don't want him in the town hall. They don't want him on the street corners. They don't want him in the motel. They don't want him in the lobbies. They don't want him anywhere. They don't even want him in a church. That's where we're at. That famine's been sent by God because he's dealing with men's hearts. Watch this, verse 12. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from north even to east. And they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall what? That's where we're coming to in America pretty bad. Yeah. You can barely find an old-fashioned Bible-believing church that will preach the book the way it's supposed to be preached and not cater to somebody's wallet so they can become a puppet on a string and dance so these guys can build them to buildings because preachers think a church is a building and not a group of people. Yep. Amen. Amen. And we go to camp meetings. They want to make sure when you go to a camp meeting that nobody gets up and makes anybody feel bad. It's a time of refreshing. We're all beaten down. We all feel so bad. We just come to get our batteries charged. And if you preach against our sins and where we're failing and the faults and the failures of our ministries, you're not going to help us, preacher. Encourage us. Get right. There you go. How's that? For starters. Amen. Quit your sinning. How's that? People don't want to hear that stuff. And they're going to meeting after meeting after meeting and there's even good preachers and they're saying, now no gut cut preaching. You know what he just said? Don't preach on sin. Don't be hard. Give them a sugar cube. That's what's happening. A lot of these guys are going to camp meetings instead of old time revivals. Evangelists are starving to death. Why? Because these preachers don't want them to come in and preach on sin. The average person don't want an evangelist in. Why? Because he's going to preach on sin and tell us where we're wrong and tell us how to live right and tell us what's wrong with society. Hard to hear truth. The only way you will get help is some man of God peel the bark off your tree and put his finger down right where you're living and where you're thinking and what you're watching and where you're going. Amen. Well, I tell you, that's, that's the part we don't want. We want to be able to put on the costumes of the Pharisees and go through the religious motions and everybody thinks we're spiritual. Come on. But we don't want nobody to get down inside here because we put on our mask. We put on our costumes. We can fit in. We know how to play church. And then we get on our iPads and look at things and see things and hear things we should... Well, you can't say that no more. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to tell you, you, people got access to sin. I mean, full-blown sin right there. And then they lay in bed and they're dreaming about things. They're thinking things. And God's right there. But they don't want to hear that. The eyes of the Lord in every place behold the evil and the good. He's coming! He's coming! He's coming! Here 85,000 sermons on... The day I got saved, that's a great day. We ought to shout about the great day that we got saved. People don't want to hear the truth. You know what the problem is in our Christian life? Is we got a fleshly nature that defeats our spiritual nature. And we got a fleshly heart that don't want to follow the spiritual mind. And that thing wants to get out of the banks, jump the track. I used to have an old racetrack with big cars on it. And the problem was, you give it a little bit too much gas, it'll jump the track. And you got to get up and you got to always go put the car back on the track. 
Listen, that's our Christian life. We got so much horsepower in our, in our car, amen. We hit the button, go around the corner, boom, jumps track. We got to have God come and put us back on track. And it delays everything, slows down everything, and we can so easily get off track. Amen. We got bus lines that run by my house. They're on these power cables. Every now and then, it, them things will jump off track, and somebody's got to come out, and they got to take a stick, and they got to try to get that thing back up on track, and it slows people down. Listen, that's, that's, we have a fleshly nature that wants to overtake. It lays dormant. It plays possum. It wants to get involved. And if we don't keep that thing in subjection, I know preachers say, yeah, you're only supposed to shear the sheep once a year. But the Bible says all flesh is grass. Amen. And we got to mow our lawns at least once a week. <laughs> right? The weeds get out of control. We got to weed our spiritual gardens. Amen. So the Lord said he's going to send it. He's going to send that famine. All right. I didn't think I had nothing to say, and I got too much to say. Let's go to Psalms 12. Not only is the word of the Lord precious, Psalm 12. Psalm 12. Um, I read through my Bible. Do you guys read through your Bible? I read through mine. And uh, I like it. A lot of times we'll get preachers to call our attention to verse 6 and 7. But uh, when, you, when you spend all your time just worried about those verses, you miss some other ones like verse 1. Help, Lord, for the godly man what? Sound like 2015 in America? Isn't there a preacher on our prayer list we've been praying for to quit? He ceased. He gave up. He quit. The church wasn't. He's having to sacrifice too much from his family, taking too much away from his family because they needed things that God couldn't provide. So now i got to work a job or two to provide for my family and supply their need and rob God and not pay my tithes so my family can get all the carnal, physical, worldly, warm fuzzies that we need and neglect the spiritual. <clears throat> Help, Lord, the godly man ceases, and the faithful fail among the children of men. Boy, isn't that something? They speak vanity every one with his neighbor, and flattery with his lips, and with a double heart do they speak. Boy, oh boy, isn't that, isn't that right up to date? Isn't that your average church? Huh? They speak really good to people's faces, but in their heart, totally different. <laughs> Listen, people call you up, hey, brother, how you doing? I haven't talked to you so long. Oh, I want to talk. Oh, oh, oh. And they just want to pour the butter on. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, you know, I, I need an offering. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yeah, they come in flattering, buttering you up. Oh, man, my dear lost. Oh, brother, man, I pray for you every day. Oh, brother. I said, man, you ain't thought about me in years. You understand? Why don't you just call me up? Bro, I'm, I, my truck broke down and I need some help. Can you help me? Why don't you just be honest? Why, why do we got to play games? Why don't you say, man, I blew a transmission. I'm trying to get some preachers together. If, if I get 100 churches, give me 100 bucks and pay for the transmission. Why don't you say something like that and then say, hey, how you doing? Beside? Why don't we get the real reason you called me out of the way first, then talk to me. Why do we got to go through all the butter? Why do you got to spray perfume through the phone? Oh, amen. The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Who have said, with our tongue we will prevail, and with our, amen, and our lips are our own. And then watch this. Who is Lord over us? I'm my own boss. Okay. That's where we're at. Who's, who's Lord over us? Who's going to tell me what to do? Ain't the preacher. Ain't no man. Ain't no woman. Listen, I'm my own boss. In fact, I'm my own God. You know what? We're living in America and we're free. And the problem with America is we got 30 or 330 or 340 million chiefs. No Indians. <laughs> hey Amen. Listen, well, I, was, I went to deal with some churches and need preachers. And I sat back and asked them. They said, you'll be in charge of all the spirits and we'll be in charge of the physical. I said, where's the buck stop? Who's got the final say? You? Me? The richest man in the church? A judge, a lawyer? Who's got the final say? 
A woman that inherited $50 million from her husband, she's pulling the purse strings. Who's got the final say? They all want to be pious. They say, well, the Word of God. Well, what's the Word of God say? He's got the final authority. According to Acts 20, verse 28, who's got the final authority? Anybody know Acts 20, verse 28? Who has the final authority? None of you know that. The Holy Ghost made us overseers. He purchased the church of God with His own blood. And He appoints overseers. The Holy Ghost appoints certain men, amen, to lead a congregation, amen. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 7, Obey them to have rule over you. Somebody ought to have a rule. Who taught you the Word of God? Doesn't sound like your boss. Doesn't sound like the president. Doesn't sound like your congressman. Doesn't sound like your mayor. Somebody that teaches you the Word of God. Hello. Amen. Listen, that's what their attitude is. Who is the Lord over us? I'm not trying to be your Lord. He said not as lords over God's heritage. Amen. Listen, I know some preachers that you got to go in and you got to check in with them if you can go on vacation. And you got to check into them. They got to they got to walk you with a hand. Okay, let's go look at the car you want to buy. Okay, nah, you shouldn't buy that one. Let's go back home. Hello, because they think you're numb numb. That ain't what pastoral authority is all about. You understand what I'm saying? But people sit back and twist it. Verse five: the oppression of the poor. And a sign of the needy. Now will I arise, say the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are what? Pure words. <laughs> Isn't that a blessing? The purity of the word of God. This book is pure. How pure is this? Well, hold your place there and turn to Proverbs 30. Let's see how precious the word of the Lord, or pure the word of the Lord is. Proverbs chapter 30. Verse 5, every word of God is what? Pure. pure. Every one of them. So what are they doing taking them out if it's pure? Why didn't I be take out 65,000 of them if it's pure? Some reason there's a bunch of preachers out there that claim to be saved and call the priest to get up behind the pulpit and remove words which they think is leaven, poison, filth, corruption, vile. And they're removing them. Like taking the names of the Lord and Jesus and Christ out of the Scriptures. It must be impure. I like what Randy Townsend said. He said, if I made any mistake, he said, I'd be putting Jesus' name in it and God's name in it and the Lord's name in it all over the Bible. I'd add it more to it. But God put how much he wants in there, but men are removing the Lord out of there all the time. What's wrong with the Lord? Is that impure? He is a shield on them that put their trust in him. Watch this. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a... Liar. Psalm 119. Psalm 119. The words of the Lord are pure words. Every word is pure. Do you got an every word Bible? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I got an every word Bible. I believe I have a King James Bible that is exactly written the way God wants me to have it. Somebody said, you found a mistake in the word of God. If I found one, I still wouldn't change it. Amen. I wouldn't touch it. I wouldn't change it. I don't believe. I listen, if God wanted to put a uh, punctuation problem in there to file somebody up, let him put a punctuation. He said, watch this, put it there. I don't care. <laughs> you understand? I just follow what the book says. I ain't trying to correct it. Psalm 119, verse 140. Thy word is what? And what's we'll said? Very pure. The word of the Lord is tried. It's been purified. Let's go back to Psalm 12. Listen, it's not just pure. It's very pure. Man, I'm telling you what. God, God met that little word very in there for a reason. He is showing you, hey, my book's just not pure. It's very pure. God went through this thing and made sure that it, it passed the smell test way beyond anything me and you could ever think. I've said it before. I'll say it again. No man will ever correct the Bible will be done by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost will not correct the book that he has written. 
Amen. Therefore, any man that wants to correct the book the Holy Ghost written is not led by the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost will lead men to believe his book, not correct his book. And these men all claim to be good, godly, dedicated, fundamental, holier than thou men, and they want to correct God's book. They're not led by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost will never lead a man to correct his writings. Verse 7, or verse 6. Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, a silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep what? Them. them. The argument, I've read their books. I've read their comments. Them there, they want to change from words. The context is words, not people. Thou shalt keep them, the words, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them, the words, from this generation forever. You understand? It's not the people of the passage that he's talking about. He preserved not the people. He preserved his words. The context is the words. And these men think they're so smart. We're going to the Greek, going to the Hebrew, amen, and going to the grammar and the English and sit back and try to say them is people. In the context, it's words. Listen, I ain't got but a third grade education in English. I know enough about that. Thank God I had a good teacher in third grade. I didn't get no amens out. <laughs> Watch this. I told you at the beginning, a lot of times we'll run the passage of Scripture and miss something. Look at verse 8. Very clear. The wicked walk on every side when what? The vilest, the vilest men are exalted. So when you take a wicked, vile man and make him president of the United States, guess what happens? Wicked walk, wicked walk on every hand, every side. They're, they're glorifying a wicked man. He glorifies wicked people. He glorifies wickedness. What's the issue right now out there in the news media that everybody's ate up about that this man promotes? No. That's that's transgender. That's beyond that. What's what's all the news media been up upset about the last couple weeks and months? I think it's his Iran deal, isn't it? That's part of it, but that's that's not the main thing. I'm talking about wickedness beyond comprehension, human mind. Yeah. Huh? Yes. Planned Parenthood. No. What's going on with Planned Parenthood? People leaked out five or six videos of Planned Parenthood people talking about how they're selling the baby parts. And how they're talking about, they just brought out, they talked about Planned Parenthood can abort a baby, bring it out, its head completely out, and you can take its brain and use its brain. They're selling baby parts left and right. Planned Parenthood and Barack Obama and all them are out there trying to do everything they can to get this subject off the table. They don't want to deal with it. They're trying to bring up anything. They're hoping, please, get this off the front page. And everybody's all upset. Our tax dollars ought not fund Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood goes, oh, we do so much for the family. We work so much for the family. Abortion is just a part of it, but we really don't fund that. Listen, they're spinning their wheels trying to get out of this. What? Wicked men walk on every side when what? The vilest men are exalted. They're exalting this vile man, which is for infanticide. That if the baby comes out of the womb, you still don't want it. Stick a drill in its head, suck its brains out, and you can sell the rest of the body parts. They are sitting there filming, going in and talking to these people, and they can preserve any part of that body they want and give them that, that part of the body they want, and they're selling baby parts to laboratories and everything else. They're butchering them. You know what that is? That's murder. Amen. I said that. I, li I read after Dr. Rubman. I listen after Dr. Rubman. And I disagree with what he says about abortion. You understand what I'm saying? I believe it's murder. Hands that shed innocent blood. There's nothing more innocent than a baby in a womb. Right. Amen. And these people are promoting the murder of children. You think God's going to overlook that thing? 55 plus million dead babies they're, they're affording to do because a woman's got a choice. I got a choice. How about we take her life? Yeah. Hello? Amen. <laughs> Amen. You know, they, they change it. It's a fetus. Hello? Oh, so that now, now it's not a baby anymore. I see. You had to go to college to design a new name for that thing in the womb, right? And they stop a beating heart. Amen. They had a video years ago called a silent scream. 
And somebody somehow was able to put a, a picture video in there. And that baby, when they went in and they poked it to try to kill it, that baby, you can see, go like that. And they would show that video and women would literally leave and leave abortion clinics and give up having an abortion when they watched that little baby scream. I got a picture of an abortion right here in my Bible. You see, why? So I can be mad. So I can get angry at that junk. I think we ought to take the doctors and nurses and the people paying for it and our senators, our congressmen, and I think we ought to just start a limited time and start ripping them to pieces and kill them. This land will not quit crying until the blood that shed that blood is shed. Our country is flooded with blood yep. of innocence. And if man shed blood by man, shall thy blood be shed. And listen, God is not sitting around. He is looking for somebody to take their blood. And it's supposed to be the leaders of the land, according to Romans chapter number 13. They've got the power of God to be able to take life and execute righteous judgments. But they threw his book out, and they're making a bunch of money, and they're making money lying in their own pockets. So therefore, they're butchering people through population control. And all saying that a woman's got her right to do whatever she wants to do with her body. You men ain't got no control over my body. How dare you want me to be the incubator for you? Good. And I ain't got nothing to do with that. That's the way God designed it, set it up. And if a man really loves a woman and a woman loves a man, they want to do right by God. They'll want to have children. Ain't got nothing to do about incubation. Each one's got her own, own part in a family to build it. I didn't design it. I didn't create it. I'm just trying to follow what God said to do. And when we want to get in there and kill and butcher and murder, he's a wicked man and he's leading about wickedness and corruption and filth and the wicked walk on every side. Well, I'll tell you what, man. He is taking down the law. He's getting rid of the word of God and civil unrest and filth and corruption is running everywhere, stealing and murders up. They're fighting gun control, and the whole time they're fighting gun control, they're giving guns to criminals. They're bringing in the drugs, the Bushes and the Clintons. Listen, man, the Clintons had just as much problem, or the Bushes had just as much problem bringing in the dope and the dope traffic. Amen. They're all scandalous. They're all crooked. They're all vile. They're wicked. And they're throwing out this book. You know what we need? We need a man that believes his book in the pulpit, in the, in the White House. Right. We need a whole Congress in the center. Could you imagine 450 Baptist preachers up there? Uh -huh. huh? In the Congress? And in the House? Making laws? Who do you think come up with a Bill of Rights? There's an old-time Baptist preacher. Yep. Help lay down a law. That's why they're all against it. So what happens when you get rid of the book? Wicked walk on every side. If I house men, I can't even get in the word today. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for being so good and kind to us.